the energy market in Canada is currently uh, relatively less competitive um, compared to its European market example uh, in Denmark. Uh, the market is extremely segmented. Um, there are relatively few competitors in the, in the wind energy space and they all have relatively small uh, megawatt capacities. Um, there's also the question of other sources of alternative energy, for example, solar power. Now, solar power has had a lot of difficulty um, with their profitability in the North American market as they struggle to compete with uh, European firms which have subsidies uh, and the Chinese which have very low uh, production costs. That's the, really the, the wind power energy market in Canada um, is a very positive industry going forward. Uh, all in all, it's also a very attractive uh, opportunity when compared to the, the Danish uh, wind market, uh, which is currently very saturated, it's quite mature, and has limited potential for growth. Uh, despite the subsidies, it does lack the, purchase, uh, the power purchase agreements uh, that Canada currently has. Now, in terms of the strategy of Eurowind in particular, the company grows through two main ways. They grow organically through greenfield investments, and they also grow inorganically by acquiring companies in early development stages. Um, their exit strategy following these, uh, these acquisitions, they look to divest these assets um, around two years after, after uh, operations had begun. Um, after they collected sufficient wind data, uh, and um, they usually sell these, these firms to, to infrastructure firms who are looking to invest in long-term assets with minimal management requirements. Um, this allows them really to collect uh, uh, a high exit price um, and really uh, a high return on their investment given that there is minimal operational risks uh, once the, the wind turbines have been established and operated for about two years. So ultimately, this strategy for growth aligns well with the Blower Wind Farm. The Blower Wind Farm is a project that was undertaken by the Wind, Move, the wind Movement Company, uh, which is a small developer operating in Quebec. They have around 10 years of experience. Uh, they have minimal employees. Uh, and as I mentioned, they are looking to divest their, their Blower Wind project. Um, it's located in New Richmond, Gethys, Ontario. They have a projected installed capacity of around 100 megawatts, um, which should be able to allow them to power around 30,000 houses in Quebec going forward. Um, around six months ago, they secured a PPA with Little Quebec. Um, now, the issue going forward is that they still have yet to secure a turbine supplier agreement uh, with Siemens. Now, the turbo, uh, turbine supplier agreement, or the TSA, uh, relates to the design, manufacturing, procurement, and installation of wind turbines. They're also still looking to secure uh, a balance of plant contract, which is essentially uh, the construction of the, of the plant and the uh, really will allow them to, to export that energy to, to the markets that need it. Now this is a critical component of the wind power energy sector. Um, it's really a question of taking that energy that's created in those high wind sectors and transporting it to those cities that really require that, that energy. So the acquisition ultimately will be contingent on the target securing that TSA uh, and the BOP. So our alternative today, we could either invest or not invest in this particular project. Given the compelling valuation in the industry uh, and the fact that the target aligns well with your growth strategy in the future, we would recommend you to pursue the investment of this strategy. Now, how are you going to pay for this investment? We have two alternatives available to us today, either debt or equity. Um, especially given the high uh, degree of operating leverage, uh, as well as the front-loaded uh, capacity uh, capital expenditures relating to, to wind projects, uh, we would recommend you to maximize the amount of debt um, to acquire the company. Uh, furthermore, acquiring with a large amount of debt will allow you to achieve a higher rate of return uh, on the residual equity investments. Um, there are also three different um, uh, options in terms of debt, which we'll be covering in our implementation section. So, uh, in terms of strategic, strategic rationale, the deal makes a lot of sense, especially in terms of the compelling valuation for the industry, uh, as well as the fact that it aligns well with the Eurowind strategy going forward. Um, that being said, it's still important to look at the numbers, so I'll pass it over to Ludovic, uh, who will uh, go over the valuation. So for the numbers, we decided to use a DCF. So let's look at the key step that we use. First of all, uh, we look at the initial capex and the decommissioning, also known as the ARO. After we will follow the assumptions, the income statement, the cash flow statement, Finally, we'll look at the summary of this valuation and look at the sensitivity of this valuation. So, as you can see, there are three um, major steps in this uh, valuation. First of all, the initial capex. 
Um, next, um, the NPV of the decommissioning, and also uh, the present value of the free cash flow after the transaction fees, which will result in the present value of the project or the DCF. So the income statement, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, NPV of the decommissioning and the initial capex. So first of all, uh, for the ARO, uh, the present value of the cost um, is 240 million. However, uh, it provides a tax shield, which results only in a in a retirement cost, the present value of the asset retirement obligation of 190 million. So it is not as high as the 5 million that is explained in you for you uh, by the government. So also the initial capex, um, the cost of the turbine is uh, 285 million. However, you'll be able to capitalize the interest cost and depreciate it over time, which will also provide the action. So now looking at the, free, uh, the key assumptions for the free cash flow, uh, the line lease uh, as, as a um, we need 2.5% of the revenue and the 2,000 per turbine. Also, the operating and maintenance expense will be based on the, the production at $14, and the tax rate will be 30%. For a, a very important number here is the change in, work in the account receivable, which is based on the increase in revenue. Uh, since Hydro-Quebec uh, take one month to uh, pay back uh, his liability, we assume that one tw uh, 112 or one month of um, of the revenue increase will be uh, the change for the, the, free, the, the cash flow statement. So just a quick look at the WAC calculation that we decided to use. Um, the cost of that, we assume 4.8 uh, premium on the, on the current uh, um, Canadian rate. Uh, also, um, you can see the average adjusted beta, which is based on the average uh, of the comparable companies. And finally, we decided to uh, implement a risk premium, given the small size of this company, of 2% which will result in a whack of a very low whack of 4.7%, a result of the 85% debt financing. So now the, the income statement. Uh, just one key number that we'd like to highlight uh, in this model. Uh, the DNA of the turbine, uh, which is uh, using a CCA rate of 50%. However, only 50% of that 50% will be realized in the first year uh, for tax purposes. So we decided, uh, so it results in uh, 81 million in the first year and uh, a very high number in the next four years. However, in the long term, it will converge towards zero. So now moving to the cash flow statement. As you can see, the key numbers here is really the, the change in working cap, which is driven by the, the account receivable from Hydro Quebec. So now let's take a look at the summary of the three steps. So the initial capex, 325 million. Uh, the NPV of the commissioning, only 189K and the present cap value of the free cash flow, uh, 45, uh, 455 million, which will result in a present value of 130 million. So now just a quick sensitivity table. Uh, the net capacity factor, uh, it is assumed uh, as it was provided uh, um, to be 38.7%. However, uh, looking at the change, um, this, is a, this is not a main factor. And the, the WAC, um, again, it does vary uh, uh, a lot and impact uh, the price that you should pay. So moving forward, um, I will now pass it to uh, Dino, who will talk about implementation. So it's important. It's important to note, Mr. Dumas, Mr. Kalafnakis, that we have given you an option here to buy for 130 million approximately. It's important to note as well that uh, this decision cannot be uh, pursued without a, a proper implementation. It's really the most important step uh, in any decision, in any business decision as well. So next slide, please. So we have a couple of timelines here for you prepared. Uh, so the first one is really starting from today. You have the investment meeting. Uh, you have to come in with the preparation, the notes, all these calculations, all the valuation that we, we did for you today. Finally, we have to hire, you have to hire a Canadian tax, a legal or M&A advisor. Uh, you are new to this country. You have never made an investment. Uh, you need to, to know the all abouts, the, 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 you know, the uh, tax implications essentially, uh, which we included in the investment in the, uh, sorry, the uh, in initial transaction fee, which we uh, tagged at 4%, so that's included. Uh, finally, we have to sign an NDA, so a non-disclosure agreement, just to make sure that uh, we have the most proper information, so you would uh, provide us with current up-to-date financial statements of where you are exactly in terms of the investments that you're currently making. Uh, finally, uh, due diligence was already made by yourselves as buyers. Uh, the seller will also have to make due diligence. They will want to know exactly how much debt you will be using. Uh, as we mentioned, it's going to be 85%, which is about the maximum that you told us and that the banks would be willing to accept. 
Uh, finally, we would secure the deal about, uh, if I just turn your attention, to 2013 Q1, so it would take about a year, a uh, year and a little bit more, maybe 12 to 15 months. Uh, this would be after regulatory approval. Uh, you are a foreign company coming in and purchasing a can uh, Canadian asset. So uh, we do not think this is a huge risk. Uh, it's a very consolidating market. Uh, the PPA is already there from the Quebec government. Uh, so we don't think this is a really big risk that you should uh, worry about. Next slide, please. So then the next timeline, so the construction of the uh, project. Uh, so we need to secure, we still need to secure the BOP uh, and the, uh, the turbine agreement. So these are two clauses that you should make in a definite um, purchase agreement uh, with, uh, with the company, uh, because these are really the two key steps. Without these, uh, the project is not going forward. So assuming that you do secure uh, these two things before the uh, agreement is made, we go ahead with the construction, so 2014 to 2017, spanning about three years. Uh, following that, uh, starting of operations at 2017, quarter one. And then the exit strategy, so very important. So your firm likes to exit investments after approximately two years. So you like to ramp up the production, uh, review the wind data, and then try to sell the investment at a uh, proper price. It's gonna be important to note that the exit strategies might pose a little bit of a risk. Right now, a lot of the companies have been leveraging themselves. A lot of your comparable companies are at above 100% debt uh, to equity. Uh, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be, might be a bit difficult to get comparable companies purchasing. However, you might try to find an investment fund. Uh, these are still gonna be uh, hungry for a little bit of appetite, a little bit of risk, especially that uh, construction, like you, you are an expert at this, so construction will, get, will have been completed. You will, will have been in production for two years. So the risk is a little bit of a risk in terms of finding a suitable buyer for the exit strategy. Uh, while we still think this is mitigated by the fact that we will be able to find an investment fund. So for the financing, so we need $110 million of financing, which is about 85% of the total deal. You have two choices. You can go to a Canadian bank, uh, you can go to an international bank, or you can find an invest, uh, institutional investor. Uh, so Canadian bank, uh, there's a little bit of financial risk. It's going to be about seven years uh, that they like to give. Uh, they are a little bit of risk adverse at the moment, so they might not be willing to give you a long-term contract. Uh, the institutional banks may be willing to give you a little bit of a longer term contract. So we are aiming really for a bullet point uh, international bank investment at about 15 years or so. The institutional investor, uh, on the other hand, uh, there's no really such deals out of the main Canada, so it might be a little bit hard to find a buyer. Uh, so really are pegging your hopes on financing this deal through an institutional uh, bank. Next slide. So the company coverage. So since we use bullet, uh, bullet uh, debt, uh, the coverage, the, co uh, the interest uh, expense coverage is a little bit different. So the coverage that, the covenants that you supplied with us and are the norm in the uh, industry is about 1.25 uh, in terms of EBITDA interest expense. Uh, here we have 5.1, which is much higher and obviously uh, seems good. Interesting, to, important to note, it is bullet point form, so we're paying the interest and none of the principal. Uh, however, with numbers that Ludovic provided just uh, previously, the free cash flow, uh, we would be able to repay all of the debt after three years. Uh, however, we would like to start a sinking fund and then eventually repay it in 15 years. So even though, even if it would be uh, including principal repayment um, expense, uh, it would still be over the 1.25, it's important to know. So the special purpose vehicle, it's gonna be important also uh, to define exactly everybody's responsibilities. So the shareholder agreement should have the responsibility, so it should be yourself, Mr. Dumas, and Kolokanakis that will be responsible for this investment. Uh, you are new to Canada, but however, with uh, good m and advisors, a uh, good legal team, you should be able to uh, take care of this investment for the full construction and uh, production. Uh, following that, the creditors. So the covenants, 85% of debt, which is reached at $110 million on the $130 million deal. And the 1.25 interest rate show coverage, which as I mentioned is a little bit different from the numbers I provided, uh, it's, that we provided. It's uh, 5.1, it's decreasing over time, and it's still gonna be over your 1.25 uh, on a prorated basis, uh, depending on the type of debt that you're able to uh, secure. And finally, the contractors. So it's little networking capital needed uh, after the operations uh, begin. Uh, it's really, uh, that's, that's why investment institutional funds will be wanting to buy your, uh, your investment project after two years. There's really not much work to be put into it. Uh, but really the important part and the important two clauses will be obtaining your, uh, your contracts before the deal is secured. So risk and mitigations, there is quite a few risks in this deal. Uh, so to, to, to start off, unable to finance a purchase. So you would want to possibly lower, lower the covenants uh, maybe use a little bit less debt if possible. 
uh, as a mitigation. As a contingency, you would seek a cheaper cost of debt. Uh, the cost of debt is already pretty cheap. It's at about 1.2% uh, in terms of the, the bond rate, uh, and we use about 4.7%. Uh, so it's still pretty cheap. However, if you're unable to finance, try to seek a lower cost, uh, or try to decrease your debt to, uh, to equity capital to begin with. Uh, finally, increase construction costs. So you would try to change the contracts that you have. So development costs, if you, it's very, very uh, plausible that your construction costs may increase. Uh, we have seen it currently in the Canadian market in terms of uh, minerals mining. Uh, so you would seek alternative DOP contracts. Right now, you have a possibility with Siemens at $2,000 per turbine. Uh, in terms of uh, the turbines, you could try to seek a cheaper buyer or as well as the infrastructure. So the infrastructure as well, we could try to seek a uh, cheaper infrastructure uh, BOP contract. And uh, finally, I'm just gonna skip over to the last one. So if we're unable to find an investor after two years, you would try to seek, as I mentioned, the investor uh, uh, an institutional fund instead. Uh, so just to conclude, just to wrap things up for what we did to you today, for, for you today, we really do like the strategic uh, analysis at this point. It, the valuation makes sense. Uh, the debt and the covenants are reached, and we really like to thank you and open for any questions. I have a question. Why uh, do you go with the bullet loan? Okay. So just in terms of the ease of calculation, we use bullet point form, uh, bullet okay. point debt. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the interest payments are going to be decently small without the principal repayment. Uh, we found that this payment would give you the most flexibility. You'd have the most flexibility in terms of free cash flows. Uh, now the problem would be to really you know, be able to find a, find a bank that would be willing to give you a bullet point debt for this type of project. Uh, however, we think even if it were to be bullet point debt, uh, even with the principal repayment, you'd still be open to covenants. If uh, your, your bank, if your loan was like amortized throughout your project, uh, would you use the same valuation method? Uh, yes, we would. We still use DCF and free cash flow. Uh, we would just basically have okay. To free cash flow. Do, would you? Would you? We would remove uh, all the amortization or in the sinking fund. We would remove the, the payment that we would make to the bank. Okay. And the free cash flow. Okay. Which, uh, which is will also lower the debt. So uh, for the equity investor, it will not change uh, that much for the returns. How how is your bullet point? Uh, your, your bullet point loan uh, influencing your valuation? Well, is it because you said it's easier for valuation purpose? It's, it's also maximizing uh, the WAC because you're, you're uh, keeping your level of debt at 85%. So um, given that you're able to secure a debt at a lower rate than your equity, uh, maximizing the debt will maximize uh, your returns okay. for the equity investors. Okay. Uh, how did you calculate or what numbers did you use when you did the IR? All these, the 12.4% 12, 12 IR. Well, the 12.4% uh, is the IR and also the discount rate. So uh, it is the same thing in this case, given that you pay the full price. But you, but you dis did you discount the cash flow to the firm or cash flow to the equity? To the equity. Well, the, um, we, well, the cost of equity is 12.4% and okay. the cost of that is 4.8. So the IR for the company uh, is 12.4%. Uh, is, uh, in terms of the, when I look at your timeline, uh, <coughs> why is the well, why did you decide to do the, the construction until end of 2016? It was when indicated that it would take three years to construct. Yeah. Uh, the timeline we were given for the construction costs were beginning of 2014. Okay, because there was a construction cost schedule from July 2012 to... We were, we were given an uh, area. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Sorry about that. Would you use a, a swap rate for the uh, a, a interest swap for uh, for your bank loan? No, we finance it with uh, Canadian um, dollars, okay. which will uh, offset the risk. So your payments will be made uh, in Canadian dollars, however your, your returns will also be in Canadian dollars. So in that way, you're, you're uh, in edging that risk. Okay, but I said interest, interest swap, not, uh, not currency swap. Oh, um, yeah. okay. So
So um, well, we, we didn't use it. We assume that uh, the, given that we have a longer uh, longer debt, we, we, because we use the international banks, uh, we believe that it will be locked in and uh, secure at four point eight percent in the longer term. Okay. The, when you calculate your cost of equity, yes. basically uh, you took the average adjusted beta. Exactly. So the so why didn't you try to adjust for the capital structure of each of the publicly traded companies? Uh, yes. Um, well, uh, it, on average, uh, it was very similar. The companies are very leveraged, so we were comfortable with uh, the adjust the the adjust of the beta of each of the companies. Can you use the, the six one? I think it was, there were six in the case. Yes, All the uh, companies? Actually, actually, we excluded the smaller one of 12, 12 million. Okay, but, uh, the one who had no debt, did you? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, and uh, technically, so you just assumed that the leverage for all these companies were similar? Exactly. Fair enough. And where did you take your market premium of 8%? Well, just based on the historical data. On average, um, there's a common number to use eight percent. Okay. And did, did did you so you didn't try to uh, do a split among the comparables because some of the comparables were actually like operating operating assets and others were actually developing projects. Mm -hmm. So it, when you did your average, did you try to weight more the uh, the beta of the ones who were developing projects? No, it was the um, the beta was a, a small number. Uh, in, in the assumption, and uh, given that we really wanted to explore all the alternatives and mm -hmm. look at the uh, different metrics, we just focus on the average of uh, the, the six components. My question for you is